All right, again, welcome everyone to today's Humanities Forum. There's a great crowd. I'm so glad you all came out. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to Humanities Forum before, this is a regular part of the offerings at Providence College. Most Friday afternoons, we have guest lectures, people come in to talk about all sorts of interesting things, although not here, because the crowd is a little bigger. Usually it's in Rouen. Uh, the Humanities Forum is an initiative of the DWC program, founded not quite a decade ago by Raymond Hain in the Department of Philosophy. The Humanities Forum has been created as a place to bring scholars, artists, journalists, and other public intellectuals together to help spur a stimulating conversation within the Providence College community. Past lectures include MacArthur Genius Grant Award winners, Pulitzer Prize winners, and even authors featured by Oprah Winfrey's book club. You still got that to shoot for. That's a big one. Yeah. The highlight of these events are these lectures. But whenever you come to the lecture, please make sure to stay, first for the questions and then for the reception that will take place afterwards. It will feature great food, but it will also provide an opportunity for you to sit and talk, well, to stand and talk with other students, professors, and maybe even the speaker himself. This week, as our special guest, we welcome Duff McDonald, who we're proud to include in the list of speakers who have come to the Humanities Forum. Mr. McDonald is an award-winning business journalist, originally from Toronto. He has his business bona fides, including a degree from Wharton Business School and a stint working at Goldman Sachs. He also has a fine journalistic pedigree, writing for magazines including Vanity Fair, GQ, New York Wired, and Newsweek. He has written three books, including Last Man Standing and The Firm, but today he will speak about his latest book, The Golden Passport, Harvard Business School, The Limits of Capitalism and the Moral Failure of the MBA Elite. Now, for those of you who aren't German scholars, I'm going to tell you a word today. It's schadenfreude. It's the pleasure you derive from someone else's misfortune. And I'm going to give you an okay, and you'll get my blessing, to have a little bit of schadenfreude as you hear Mr. McDonald talk about Harvard Business School. It's okay. I read the whole, I actually, I listened to the 20 hour book while I was walking to and from campus. And at times I was laughing out loud. It's okay to feel that show in front, but don't stop there. If you, I want to ask you if PC could endure the gaze of, gaze of our distinguished guest. Moored by a commitment to a Catholic and Dominican tradition, we have not made the same mistakes as Harvard. But that does not mean our business education is always producing what we want it to produce and what our society needs. I personally don't think we're doing a terrible job, but I do think we need to keep this question in the forefront of our minds. This is something that we need to have both our business school students and our liberal arts students uh, and professors thinking about on the business school side. I want to talk about one phrase, or mention a phrase. It's knocking off the core, right? Don't we knock off the core? I gotta take the ethics. I gotta knock off. I got, I got two theologies left. I got. Is that what our liberal arts education is for the business school. Is it an add-on that's something that a hurdle we have to cross just to get our degree and get on? Or is it an invaluable and essential part of our education? Now, I think that the business school has been doing a lot to try to make these things. Pat Kelly's uh, program with business ethics has been a great start. There's programs involved in the Western Civ program that do a good job. But that sense that the liberal arts are something that we do on the side where our real education happens in business sometimes leaches in. But the business school students are the only ones I want to ask to think about what they're doing. I also want the liberal arts students and the liberal arts professors to think about what they're doing. Are we training the students properly? Now, we have classes, we have a business ethics class taught um, regularly on this campus. Right now we have three sections of business ethics being offered. Uh, business ethics seems like a perfect class for business students to take, which makes sense. We have 
500 or so business and economics majors graduating each year. Is the business, are, are we training them with the business ethics class? And is that something we're making important to us, the liberal arts faculty? Uh, one measure of this is the business ethics class is being taught by a visiting faculty member. Is this something that the philosophy department is going to focus on and saying, hey, if we're going to be servicing business students and we want them to take seriously business ethics, are we giving them the support they need? I think both sides of this have much to think about because as, as uh, Mr. McDonald, uh, Mr. <laughs> As uh, Mr. McDonald is uh, thinking about what is the problems with Harvard, that we haven't made the mistakes of Harvard doesn't mean that we can't learn and think about how to make our business education better. And I think that that's one of the reasons why it's such a great honor to welcome Duff McDonald up to the stage. So if you can join me in welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. Thanks for that uh, great introduction. So, a uh, couple of things in uh, preface. Uh, to the business school students here, I am not the enemy. I uh, went to Wharton uh, undergrad, got lots of friends who work um, on Wall Street and elsewhere in business. I don't, I, my, my opinion of uh, a career in the business world is the same as it is of any other career, which is I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Harvard Business School, on the other hand, um, I do not feel so um, ambivalent about. Um, but as another um, preface, uh, just to hopefully give you an idea that I'm a more interesting person than the guy you would think could write a 600-page book on Harvard Business School. Um, the last story, the last magazine article I wrote was called The Bob Project. And the subtitle of that piece was My 25-Year Quest to Sneak Bob Dylan References into Absolutely Everything. <laughs> on that note, this talk is entitled Don't Look Back. <laughs> the Harvard Business School's inadvertent influence on American business. Uh, so influence. Influence is a tricky thing, right? You can be purposeful about trying to be influential if you want to try and influence people, but you can also have uh, influence that you did not intend, that is inadvertent. Uh, and uh, in the latter case, you often have uh, unintended consequences. And things may make sense in the moment, but it turns out that the, the effect you had was profoundly different than that which you thought you were having. Uh, and it's why uh, one of the takeaways that I would offer any business student uh, or any business school faculty uh, is that a, a really key thing to, to be doing is always to be asking yourself, why, are we, why am I doing what I am doing? whatever context it may happen to be in. And it, are there assumptions, uh, what are the assumptions that are behind my thinking, and am I still remaining true to them? And it is in, on, on that point that I think that the American Business School project, but in particular Harvard Business School, uh, has been a miserable failure. Uh, they have not stayed true to their original intentions uh, nor do they uh, entertain the idea of even reassessing them in any serious or meaningful way. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I think it's kind of a cult at this point. So the point of my talk today is that the unintended consequences of Harvard Business School's orientation reverberate through business today and globally. And let's take it from there. So backing up a little bit, I can tell you how I came to write this book. My first book was on, uh, was a biography of Jamie Dimon, <coughs> who is the CEO of JPMorgan Chase. Uh, it's called Last Man Standing. 
I feel pretty good about that because I wrote or I chose that title uh, ten years ago, and he is still the last man standing. And I wrote that a biography of him during the financial crisis. It was a really interesting time, and. Um, one of the things about Diamond is that he is famously anti-consultant. He doesn't think CEOs should be uh, bringing in strategic consultants all the time. And his point is basically, if you need someone else to tell you what you should do, then you, don't, you, need, you shouldn't be in the job you're in. And um, I was over at his apartment one time. He likes, he, uh, he likes gin martinis. So we were having a couple of gin martinis, and I was like, I'm going to get him talking about consultants. And I said, so what about that? And he went off on a brand. He's famously unfiltered. And his wife happened to walk by the library, his library that we were sitting in, and she stopped. And she said, Jamie, Duff's writing a book. <laughs> and she goes, watch your mouth and you know just remember this is all for the record and she walked away and he said all right fine he goes i meant everything i just said <laughs> maybe except for mckinsey they're different i didn't know what he meant by that at the time but i was recording so it was it ended up being in the book and uh when i was casting about for another book to write, my uh, editor said, what about McKinsey? What, uh, remember what Diamond said about them? I was like, yeah, he goes, what do you know about McKinsey? And I said, nothing. And he says, go see what you can find out. So I spent a couple weeks looking into them and I came back, I was like, this is kind of shocking. Like, this is a, they're a hundred year old firm that is utterly dominant in their industry to the point of it's difficult for a lot of people to even think of any other people. And I said, nobody's ever written a book about them. And I said, I think it's probably because they won't cooperate for a book, uh, but we should probably do it and let's do it even if they won't cooperate. And so we did that. And while I was working on my history of McKinsey, the firm, I discovered, uh, you know, I'd always known that the consulting industry was full of MBAs, uh, but I hadn't totally understood the history of McKinsey and the Harvard Business School. Uh, one of the interesting things about those two institutions is that they were both coming into uh, their own at the same time. They were founded at the same time, and they both lent each other uh, credibility. It was kind of a reciprocal fake out of the American people. Uh, and um, when I finished that book, I was out with a friend of mine and I said, I have no idea what I am going to do next. And he said, isn't it obvious? And I said, well, clearly not to me. And he said, Harvard Business School. And I said, Oh my God, you're right. And I then looked into Harvard Business School and I was like, well, the problem with that is there's been a lot of books written about Harvard Business School. I said, most of them though are either insiders' viewpoints, uh, faculty memoirs, uh, or overly um, positive uh, histories. And so I went to my publisher and I said, uh, I want to explore HBS, and I said, I don't think I've yet alienated the entire business establishment. Maybe we can finish the job with this one. <laughs> and uh, she went for it. And to my embarrassment, what I thought I was going to learn in a history of, uh, you know, the most influential business school on the planet, if not one of the most influential schools, uh, was that um, if you think of economics, which is, which is traditionally not in the business schools, there are different schools of economic thought, right? There is the Chicago School, there is neoliberal economics, there is all different kinds of uh, 
uh, ideas and philosophies of economics, and I somehow had been confused, even though I went to a business school, that the Harvard Business School would have a particular point of view about business that separated them from others or that others uh, sort of took their lead from. And Chicago is like that in economics. And what I found out to my great shock was that they don't. Uh, they t all they do is they take capitalism for granted. So uh, traditionally, if you had a, uh, most it, you know, institutions of higher learning uh, are at least in one way or there to keep the, the professions honest, right? Medical schools, uh, they don't in endorse quack medicine, right? You're not going to get, you have to meet certain standards of excellence and, and rigor. And I was sort of shocked that uh, a century's worth of Harvard Business School, I thought it would somehow rival medical research, and it didn't. And one of the first discoveries I made uh, in researching this book was I was like, the research and intellectual output of the business school is actually nothing of the sort. Uh, and it's entirely and utterly compromised by money. And, you know, I was off to the races. So, before I proceed to trash them entirely, it's like, what have they done? Harvard Business School has done a lot, right? The, uh, despite what Silicon Valley would tell you, uh, uh, HBS was the birthplace of venture capital, uh, um, without question. Uh, Silicon Valley, for a while, the VC sort of said, you know, we don't need the MBAs. It's like, well, you're the children of the MBAs. And uh, HBS helped win World War II uh, with uh, their logistics work. Uh, their work on accounting and their strategy has been hugely influential. Even the idea of the executive MBA, uh, um, continuing education, my father was a doctor, so continuing education for doctors is a great thing, right? Uh, it, my father graduated from medical school in the 60s, but he was taking stuff on lasers and stuff well in the 80s and 90s. So the idea of continuing education for managers, I think, is a great idea. I think that a good business education is partially wasted on the young because a lot of the things that you can learn uh, in business school, the most relevant, it, 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 it actually resonates more if you have some experience to bank that against. Uh, so I'm, a, I'm fully in support of continuing education. But one of the things I realized with HBS that is, is a bit of a shocker is um, at some point we started letting them take credit for things we already knew. And what do I mean by that? Um, well, you know, and it comes from an inherent problem at the heart of the business school project, which is that they claim to be conducting serious research. And uh, at HBS, uh, specifically, even more absurdly, they claim to be using the scientific method in their research. And I'll give you an example right now, which, um, you know, I don't mean to speak ill of the dead because he just died last week, so may he rest in peace. But Clayton Christensen, who is the uh, uh, creator of the theory of disruption, right? The, that thing spread like a meme, right? Everyone in this room has probably used or heard the word uh, that said that something's very disruptive uh, in recent years. It's sort of gone way off course of his original meaning, which was uh, that um, established competitors uh, n need not only be worried about co competition from their obvious competitors, they should also be worried about being taken out from below by someone selling a cheaper or even more inferior product than yours who can cut into your customer base and then come at you from the bottom. Uh, Christensen claimed that uh, he had proven this theory scientifically. And it's like, I, you don't wanna, I don't really want to get started on that because it's like, what are you talking about? This is not 
uh, people doing business is not a physics laboratory. Uh, but the point is, is like, did we really let Harvard take credit for the idea that competition can come from unexpected places? We already knew that. Uh, Michael Porter is, a, is, is probably the school's most famous professor. And he uh, is famous for writing about the five forces of competition. And um, they are the threat of substitute products, the threat of established rivals, the threat of new entrants into the market, the bargaining power of your suppliers, and the bargaining power of your customers. We already knew that too. And yet we're supposedly supposed to thank Michael Porter for telling us about it. They had been doing business for centuries before that and every single person who's ever run a business knows all f of those five intuitively. Um, and, my, and the current dean of Harvard Business School uh, is he, he, some of his stuff, he was my favorite person to quote in the book. And um, I'm going to read you an interesting one here. This is from, from a book that he wrote before he was the dean. And it was on networks. Uh, relative to electronically mediated exchange, the structure of face-to-face -face interaction offers an unusual capacity for interruption, repair, feedback, and learning. In contrast to interaction that, interactions that are largely sequential, like email, face-to-face -face interaction makes it possible for two people to be sending and delivering messages simultaneously. The cycle of interruption, feedback, and repair possible in face-to-face -face interaction is so quick that it is virtually instantaneous. And I said, I think I can summarize that in a lot uh, shorter sentence with a lot simpler words. Communication works better in person than not. <laughs> and again, um, one of the issues with, with business school research is that unlike uh, f some of the areas where there's form fundamental research going on where people are pushing the boundaries of what we know, uh, we tend to know what business is about. New things can pop up, right? Like social or um, online marketing and stuff like that where technologies change. But the, 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 the Business School Academy struggles with the new because there really isn't a whole lot new about how we do the things we do commercially. And so they strain themselves to discover the, that which we've already discovered. And um, it would, it, it, what, which just leads me to one of my suggestions. When you are, when, when you are studying uh, your business school subjects, you want to think about it. It's like you want to think about what you're reading. Because what, what Dean Noria wrote there sounds really smart. And it sounds like, oh, Jesus Christ, this guy is, uh, he, he's like a real academic. And it's no, it's just fancy language covering up a very obvious point that we knew, we knew already. So, I have three examples of uh, the Harvard Business School's inadvertent influence that I would suggest are equally, if more important, than the ways that they've positively influenced the world. And um, I, I, I present them all as just something to, um, that hopefully causes you to stop and just think about it for a second. So the first one is the case method. Do they teach by the, do you guys teach by the case method here? No, a, a little bit? Okay, so the, the case method is, right, for those who aren't familiar with it, you have lecture teaching, which is, you know, the, the one we all know where the professor gets up and tells you stuff and you write it down. And, uh, the, the case method is a more conversational approach where students go home, read cases, and then the, the, it, the classroom work tends to be it is a student-led discussion with the uh, professor acting more as facilitator 
Uh, and to me, it's like, okay, this is interesting. They, they ported it from the law school at Harvard Law School, and it's, it's a really intriguing idea, right, to put yourself in the situation of, okay, if you're the CEO of company X and competitor Y has introduced a new product at half price of yours, and they're starting to eat market share, and you were about to build a new factory, what do you do? And they put a student in the hot seat every class, and, and they get, they, it's called cold calling them. It's got to be terrifying in your first year where the teacher says, you, what would you do? And the, the unlucky student at HBS has got to basically talk for 30 minutes plus about their answer to the question and then suffer the attacks of their classmates who try to take them apart. And uh, if anything, Christ, it's got to prepare you for public speaking, right? Uh, so it's, it is not uh, a surprise that uh, HBS graduates like to talk uh, because they're very well trained at it and they're trained to do so under fire. Um, and it also teaches you to think on the spot. It also teaches you to put yourself in the place uh, of the decision maker. Uh, instead of simply stuff like uh, learning corporate finance or accounting uh, road memorization, right? So there's a lot, the case method has a lot to uh, recommend it. You know, at the same time, uh, they often speak about it. Uh, I think they overstate uh, its uh, effects and they also give, try to give it credit for things it does not deserve. And so back to the dean. Um, in a 1994 article about the case method, he said, being able to judge the parameters of a particular situation and decide what ideas and actions will work in that context is what distinguishes the truly effective manager. To which I replied, likewise, being able to judge the parameters of a particular pitch and decide which swing will work in that context is what distinguishes the truly effective hitter. Likewise, duh. <laughs> Again, they said, no, this case method teaches people to be better decision makers. And we'll go back to the dean. And he said, more often than not, Managers are thrown into situations in which they must act quickly and without certainty. To quote economist Kenneth Arrow, in many situations, we must simply act, fully knowing our ignorance of possible consequences. To which I responded, likewise, if the forecast calls for a 50% chance of rain, we must simply choose to take an umbrella or not, fully knowing our ignorance of possible weather. What Noria is arguing is that the case method gives one the ability to choose how to proceed in a given situation. With all respect to him and economist Kenneth Arrow, most of us don't need an economist to tell us we don't always know what's gonna happen next and that we sometimes have to make a decision before we'd like to. That's called life, and it hardly merits bragging about. Imagine a physics department claiming that its graduates have the ability to conduct experiments. So, you had a case method that started with a great idea, and the next thing we knew, the professors at HBS were given the green light to take board positions at the companies that they wrote cases about. It was a way to, uh, uh, one way to keep the, the faculty from going, looking for jobs in industry, because uh, academia is not the highest paying job there is. And, uh, but the school justified the, the move by saying, it will allow our professors to get closer to companies so that they really understand the action so that they can really tell our students what is going on. That is why we are doing it. And I want to 
to give you an example of how that is not true. At, and this is an example from my book. So there is a professor at uh, HBS, his name's Thomas Piper. Um, he uh, wrote a couple case studies on Marriott, the hotel company. So here's a timeline for you. Thomas Piper meets one of the Marriott heirs, becomes friends with him, uh, arranges for Marriott to get a four and a half million dollar a year food service contract with Harvard Business School's cafeteria. In that contract is signed in September 1981. In December 1981, Thomas Piper publishes a case study about Marriott, which is a big wet kiss to the management of Marriott. It doesn't mention the food service contract. In January of 1982, one month later, Thomas Piper is given a board seat on, uh, on the board of Marriott, a position that he holds for a decade. So he's getting the inside view for the benefit of his students. Uh, ten years later, in April 1992, Marriott pulled the move that a lot of companies have done, and it is actually uh, not only frowned upon, in many cases it can be considered illegal because you, uh, you can make the argument that the company knew what it was going to be doing uh, in advance. They uh, issued $400 million worth of debt and then split the company in two, into good co and bad co, and pushed all the debt onto one of the halves of the company. So the people who bought the debt thought that they were, there was an, a huge entity whose cash flow would cover, would service that debt. And then Marriott split the company in two, pushed the debt onto the inferior half of the business leaving the debt holders holding a bag that they didn't buy, didn't think they were buying. So, uh, Thomas Piper resigned from the board of Marriott in protest, right? So that's, you, you think, well done, you're going to write a case about this, because this, you have the inside view, and you're going to let your students know what really happens, and teach them what, like, you know, how business is truly conducted in the real world. So, uh, Thomas Piper did not write a case on Marriott. He never updated his case on Marriott. And I asked myself, why did he not write that case? This, was, this is exactly what the faculty or the administration was talking about. We let our faculty sit on board so that they can get the real inside view so that they can then transmit that to our students. He did not do that. And I said, maybe it's because he was too busy at the time writing a book that came out the very next year, and it was called, Can Ethics Be Taught? And my response to that was, not if you don't even try. So, the case method, uh, a good idea, uh, currently prostituted, and is backward looking. It's a great way to teach students how to, uh, build a company 20 years ago. So if you're looking for that, the case method is, is where it's at. Uh, my second example for you is one that uh, is going to be much more familiar to everyone in the room uh, and is one of my pet peeves, which is Harvard Business School unleashed the leadership industry on the world. And um, what do I mean by that? Uh, for the first half of the 20th century, all business schools uh, taught uh, managers. Their product was managers. They taught management. And uh, a lot of the degrees had management in the title. And that's, es that's essentially what they do teach, right? If you're taking finance or accounting, or, um, marketing, anything, uh, you're being taught how to manage a business. And um, uh, for the first 75 years of their existence, that was a product in high demand. Uh, if you look back to mid-century post-war when um, Americans, it was probably the moment where we had peak 
regard for large institutions because it, they, those large institutions had just saved the world from the Nazis, like no wonder. Uh, the American CEO was considered a statesman and um, uh, to be a manager was to be among the elite, the power elite. And then uh, they had about 20 years of coasting and then came the 70s and, you know, the, the roof fell in, right? We had stagflation, Vietnam, uh, the Japanese and Germans invasions, uh, corporate invasions that nobody saw coming, and the American conglomerate movement just basically gorged itself to death. And uh, suddenly, American business was caught with its pants down, the country turned against business, it's where you have the dawn of everything, like uh, the environmental movement, feminism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's like suddenly America woke up and was like, wait a second, these guys don't know everything. In fact, they didn't even see our, the two big, the competition that was coming to eat their lunch until it was eating them. And the business schools were stuck in an in a interesting situation. It was suddenly they were selling a product that was no longer uh, so highly regarded and it was no longer in as much demand, the manager. And it was a Harvard professor uh, Zelesnik, who wrote in 1977, who wrote an article that changed everything. Uh, and it was entitled, Managers and Leaders, Are They Different? And, you know, the short answer is, well, obviously, right? A, a manager, um, an effective management is more of a control thing. Uh, a leadership is inspirational, right? We follow leaders. Managers tell us what to do. And, um, uh, true, true to their, you know, uh, if you think of it, it's not that difficult to think of a business school as, as a business, right? They're selling a product and they need to be selling something that people want to buy, both the students and the uh, people who hire their graduates. So HBS and then soon after, the rest of the business school academy just pivoted on a dime and said, managers, what are you talking about? We produce leaders. And um, there's a debate, right, about whether a leader can be manufactured. I, am, I take the side that no, it cannot. Leadership is an emergent quality. We'll let you know if you're a leader and you'll be able to tell because you turn around, we'll be following you. Uh, um, there are things that you can teach about effective leadership, but this idea that everyone is and should be a leader uh, is, in my opinion, is, is completely absurd. And by that I don't mean that, that every single one of us is a special and valuable person. It's that you, uh, leader, uh, leadership and leader specifically, it's like you can't have, uh, everyone cannot be a leader at once, right? You can show leadership in, in your behavior and actions, but essentially, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have any kind of uh, semblance of control or direction over a group of people doing something, you have to cede some decision-making power at some point to someone. So. Uh, Leadership to me is uh, uh, something that we can all hope for, but uh, HBS even commits a, an even greater crime and when, when their students get there, they are first year MBA students, they are told you are tomorrow's future leaders. And um, in, in some sense they've just <coughs> conflated and confused the boss with the leader. Uh, because more often than not, they're correct that a lot of these graduates will go on to be the boss of something. But leadership is something else. It's a 50 billion plus annual industry. Leadership, leadership seminars. I bet there isn't a single person in this room who hasn't been to some kind of leadership thing. And, you know, don't just take my word for it. 
uh, take someone else from Harvard. Barbara Kellerman, who teaches at the Harvard School of Government, said the following thing in her book, The Crisis of Leadership. The leadership industry has failed over its roughly 40-year history to, in any major, meaningful, or measurable way, improve the human condition. So, well done, guys, right? Like this is, and, and at, this, at the same time, because it, when I was working on the book, I ended up meeting a, a professor from MIT, and he said, God, it's so full of shit, but it's all the students want. So that's what we're giving them. And we have taken our eye off uh, more serious matters, and particularly in business education, right? There's a lot we have to learn. And to spend a lot of time talking about why everybody's a leader. Um, one, uh, one of the stories I wrote um, last year for Vanity Fair was called The Miseducation of Sheryl Sandberg. And um, the uh, HBS had done a couple case studies on Sheryl Sandberg's leadership abilities, which, which to them, it's, it's easy to, to understand if not forgive their confusion. To them, leadership is money and success. Right, and Sheryl Sandberg was brought into Facebook to be the adult in the room. Nobody needs me to tell them about the complicated thing that is Facebook today, but A, Sheryl Sandberg should be ashamed of herself. She has shown absolutely zero leadership at that company. And in fact, HBS, for celebrating uh, someone who has overseen a company that has systematically uh, betrayed uh, and lied to uh, it, an entire country, if not world, broken every promise they've ever made and shown little disregard for fact, fairness, or humanity. Uh, HBS thought this, is, this was the pinnacle of leadership. So, um, you know, I could go on with that. They, um, Peter Drucker, one of the more famous management thinkers, He's actually a really lucid thinker for anyone who's, um, you know, on the lookout for good management books. Um, and he said the following, and it, it was about the idea that business schools should be teaching, let, let's say we're going to teach leadership, right? Why should business schools be the ones to teach it? Uh, the reason that they ended up doing so was because they nominated themselves. Uh, but here's what Drucker had to say. It is a mistake to say that business schools are charged with educating leaders. They are charged with educating competent mediocrities to do competent work. That's also true of medical schools. They are not charged with educating leaders, but physicians who don't kill too many people. You can't educate leaders. Well, you can in the sense that leaders need to know a lot. But the purpose of professional schools is to educate competent mediocrities in large numbers. And that is what we are doing. Whether we are doing it well or not, I do not know. That's another matter. Just to make the point that it's not only me. Uh, and my third and final example that I'll give you is to me the most egregious of all. And it is uh, what has, it's known by a number of names, but shareholder capitalism is probably the best known, and um, we have HBS to thank for that too. So the, the first half of the century at Harvard Business School actually uh, took enlightened management as their ideal, right? They wanted to educate an enlightened managerial elite. Um, and, you know, God bless them for trying. Um, and then one person in particular radically shaped, reshaped that view, and his name is Michael Jensen. And um, in the wake of the 70s and uh, America's uh, um, sudden move from global dominance to playing catch-up 
on uh, a lot of fronts, but particularly in industry. Um, shareholders uh, were outraged that they had let the management of, of companies, that they had given them so much uh, room to run, and they wanted to rein them in. And um, the idea floated by Michael Jensen and his, his colleagues actually at the University of Chicago was, this is pretty simple. We can, we can tantalize these guys with equity, with stock, because guess what? We're all whores, right? You can buy us in the end. And in his paper on agency theory, Jensen even quoted the, the famous W.C. Fields joke, which um, I apologize if I offend anybody, but because I'm, I'm not trying to. He said, there's a, there's a, there's a famous discussion where uh, a guy says to a woman, he goes, would you sleep with me for a million dollars? And she said, yes, I would. And he said, would you sleep for me for with me for $10? And she said, what do you think I am, a whore? And he said, we've already established that. Now we're just negotiating the price. And that was the central argument in Jensen's influential paper on agency theory, which said, here's all we got to do, is motivate management with stock and stock options, and they will do what the shareholders want. And HBS hired him in 1985. This was the Reagan era. It was, anti, it was the uh, anti-union era. Uh, also, CEOs were um, looking to point the finger of blame. Uh, 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 for mismanaged, mismanaging their companies, and HBS gave them a rubber stamp, and suddenly shareholder capitalism in which all other constituencies, employees, customers, suppliers, the community, were relegated to secondary status. Uh, there is a myth in this country today that shareholders are, that companies must and have to be run in the interest of shareholders above all else. Um, I'm not the guy to break that down for you, but it's simply not true. Uh, you get courts to say it, but there is no precedent in our legal system which established that that is the case. In fact, corporate charters are uh, given to companies by the state and as a, we give them, we give, charter them with the right to do business, uh, assuming that they act responsibly. Um, so HBS, of course, didn't realize at the time, because it was the 80s and, you know, the era of Michael Douglas on Wall Street and greed is good. They had no idea how their curriculum shift towards this was going to cascade through the following decades and leave us in the situation we're in today, I would argue, in which um, inequality in this country is at a century high, right? We brought it down mid-century and now it is back up. And the, basically we've endured a rape of the economy and, and our national assets by the shareholder class. Uh, all with uh, the full endorsement of Harvard Business School. And I was stunned when I was looking into this to realize that the, ostensibly the people whose job it was to pay attention to things like this, meaning the faculty of business schools didn't even realize what was happening or, if you want to be more cynical about it, didn't care. Uh, in 1987, the dean of HBS compared the rush of MBAs into consulting and Wall Street. Um, you know, historically, the uh, MBAs had gone more into um, industry, right, like corporate jobs. Um, and he was asked about how the Finance was basically sucking all the MBAs out of um, all the business schools. And he said, I think it's crazy where they're going, 
but we ought to just relax and enjoy it. It won't last long. Uh, he either didn't comprehend what was happening or he didn't give a shit. Take your pick. It's disgraceful either way because it was his job to understand. Um, so, and I'll finish that one with, so my book was coming out in uh, um, April 2017. And uh, the school and I had a, uh, a bit of a, a contentious relationship, let's call, let's call it that. And um, the month my book came out, the cover story in the Harvard Business Review uh, was called The Error at the Heart of Corporate Leadership. And the subtitle, by two professors from HBS, the subtitle was, most CEOs and boards believe their main duty is to maximize shareholder value. It's not. And I was like, oh, such straight talk. Guys, just telling us the way it is, whether we want to hear it or not. The only problem was, is that they were out to correct a misconception that they had fostered in the first place, right? So, um, which brings me to one of my grander conclusions about HBS is I have never seen an institution that is more capable at presenting itself as the solution to a problem that it helped create. So, what can, I, what can you uh, take away from this? Uh, influence is real. Actions have consequences. Uh, but you can't always predict what those consequences are going to be. The amount of air uh, speaking and money and time that has been wasted on leadership uh, seminars is just boggles the mind. Um, that is Harvard's fault. Um, sometimes the most significant effects can come from things that nobody even notices at the time. Um, so to, I ask you to ask yourselves, you know, how many in, in, hidden influences do our most esteemed institutions have? Um, what is our opinion based on? Why do we think that? And the process of doing that made me ask, you know, when I ask a question, you know, why do I actually think certain things? Is it because I thought it through? Or is it because at some point I just thought that? Or someone told me that? And, you know, the, the necessity and demand for self-reflection, right? Who am I? Why am I doing what I do? is at least as paramount for schools as it, is, as it is for people. And in Western capitalism, one would hope that the, the caretake, the custodians of capitalism would do the same, but they're not. Um, so pay attention. And, um, you know, there are things that we set out to do, and there are the things that we set in motion, right? And those two are not always the same thing. Um, HBS was not actually interested in discussing that idea with me. And when, when my book came out, the dean gave one interview about it to one publication, uh, the Harvard Crimson, an undergraduate newspaper. And uh, such courage, right? And he said, and I paraphrase him, but he said, there's a lot that is wrong in this book there is a lot that he has missed about the great things that we do. And by the way, I haven't read it. And he essentially said uh, that he didn't care what I had to say, which um, I'm not speaking as my own personal ego. I'm saying, oh my God, you do not care what someone outside your walls thinks about what you're doing. And that's not an institution of higher learning, right? That is an outsourced PR firm for Western capitalism that's masquerading as a school, right? And at one of the reviews that came out after my book came out said, 
why don't they just privatize the thing and call it what it is, right? And I said, I'd be fine with that, right? Then at least they're doing, that. they're on the level about what it is they're actually doing. And, you know, so to all the business schools, right? To all the business students here. And again, you know, I, I wish you well, right? And the, there is nothing wrong with wanting to learn how to manage a business, manage a career, and man or manage a life. Right? There's valuable tools that you can get from every single business school course that you take, but you don't need to join a cult in order to do so. Right? What is a cult? A cult is something that doesn't uh, countenance questions about what it is doing and it demands complete obedience. Right? That is the Harvard Business School of today and it's why essentially uh, I consider it a dangerous influence. And I'll finish with one thing. Just uh, so when we were when we were coming up with the title and subtitle with the book, the Golden Passport comes from a, a 19 uh, uh, article in the New York Times in the 1980s, sometime, and they said they said that they said that uh, MBA from Harvard is a golden passport to a life of blah blah blah. So when I read that, I was like, "This is great. This is the this is the title." And the original subtitle uh, was um, Harvard Business School, The Limits of Capitalism, and the Failure of the MBA Elite. And my editor came back to me and she said, you know, it's interesting, one of our uh, uh, salesmen brought something interesting up. He said, most people when they think of MBAs don't think failure. I was like, actually, that's a really good point, right? So I was like, what should we do? And I was like, oh, wait, the moral failure of the NBA elite. And then, boom, everybody knew it was the right title. You know, basically, you know, back to the point that was made before I came up here, right, about whether a, um, the, a liberal arts component of your education is something that you should knock off and whether it's a core or not core, right? And I can tell you this from having uh, gone to a business school undergraduate, the only thing that is going to resonate with you uh, 25 years from now um, are the liberal arts courses that you took, right? Corporate finance is not memorable. It's useful, but you're not like, oh God, corporate finance, <laughs> discounted cash flow models. <laughs> uh, so again, uh, to the point of don't look back, actually that was facetious, I do mean to look back. You know, a, a life well lived is a life where you understand who you are and what you're doing, and I wish you all the best. All right, uh, Professor, uh, Mr. McDonald is on. Yep, there we go. Mr. McDonald, you get to stay up he has agreed to take questions, oh, sorry. and our tradition is that we start with students. So, the question from students, yes. He holds his opinions, which might have to get something out of it. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for your talk, and thank you for coming to Providence College. Uh, my question for you is, what plan do you subscribe to our great American businesses, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Schiffer Financial Institutions, and beyond? For hiring almost exclusively from this cult. And then, as a corollary to that, about the death of in house corporate development, like we saw in General Electric of the 80s and 90s, just as powerhouses for creating great examples. That's a great question. I think, I think one of the reasons that uh, a lot of companies hiring for future management. Uh, tend to hire MBAs is that, or business undergraduate, business school graduates, is that it's a, the schools essentially uh, offered to take on a component of screening, training, and indoctrinating. And um, I don't mean that in the most, in the scariest way. It's just like, if you want to hire someone who is sort of down with the way that you want to do things, um, 
everybody can use a rebel on their staff for some regards, but a lot of the time you just need people who are going to, you know, do what you expect them to do. And business schools are a great signaling device. Uh, it's also called credentialism, right? So uh, the, the, a business school education has, you know, has the components of what you've learned, but it also is a lot, g g gives you a way to send a signal to your potential employer, which is, I want this badly enough that I would do two years of this. So um, you can't, I, I wouldn't entirely blame the, the people who hire these people for hiring them, because it's like someone is voluntarily taken part of the internal development process off their hand. But you make a great point. McKinsey, for decades, uh, almost hired exclusively Harvard MBAs. Like, you couldn't even get a job there if you were, had a different MBA. And in more recent years, uh, they, they have stressed more than anything the growing percentage of non-MBAs that are hiring. But, you know, um, I can sympathize with an with a undergraduate or even grad student who's thinking, you know, it's a tough job market out there. Um, how do I make myself attractive to an employer uh, for thinking that a business school education is the way to do it? Because it, it, it certainly is. Um, the only thing I say to that is, um, you know, once you get the job, somewhere down the road, right? If you're, I, I cannot tell you how many people I know who went to take jobs on Wall Street and then got caught what, what they call golden handcuffs, right? I worked at Goldman Sachs, I left after two years, uh, as I like to say, to seek my fortune in journalism. And the reason I did, I left then, is because I knew that I wasn't gonna be able to. If I stayed another couple of years, the money was gonna get too good. So, um, uh, you know, you always wanna be, sort of ask yourself why you're doing what you're doing. But I think, you know, GE's a special story because it was just so huge. Um, in my book on McKinsey, I talked about how it is the most efficient producer of CEOs of public companies ever. There are on a, except for GE, McKinsey's the most efficient. Like the, the number of people who have run public companies from McKinsey, as a fraction of the number of people who have worked at McKinsey, is the greatest. Uh, uh, GE has produced an absolute higher number, um, but you know that was partly a result of the the American industrial dominance mid-century. Right, that's fallen apart because you can't. The model of GE doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, Jeff Amelt, Harvard MBA. He wouldn't talk to me either. There are questions. Pardon me if I speak at length because I'm going to a late case. Then, uh, quite a few years ago, I was told for some business ethics. Uh, it really wasn't my field. My intellectual, well, it was like formation was debate about I read a lot of Marx and I read a lot of big conservatives, so that's what I do. I labored hard to produce a fair, non propagandistic on either side, uh, intellectually strenuous, uh, and also exciting uh, and engaging business ethics course. I discovered that that's not what they wanted me to do at all in boarding school. They wanted me to tell the kids that they could make lots and lots of money. Never had to worry about the things in their lives. Uh, they could come home, sleep at night, never worry about having done the right thing, and get well. Uh, I will not insult conservatives by calling that a conservative view. It's simply inane. I try to make a mistake, and this, I have no right to be surprised. But that's what the expectation of our business ethics is saying. I was exactly, I mean, at least it's a Uh, but this had done exactly what Harvard 
business school is done. So how is a small school in Northeastern Pennsylvania going to be better than Harvard? Thank you. Sorry, what was the question? The question You know, you, it's a business ethics to me is a really interesting subject from the get go, which is uh, we just call it ethics, ethics, right? Because one of the great, uh, uh, I think, um, maneuvers of the business school academy is to have us believe uh, that it, it's a separate subject. And um, uh, yes, um, we often have to make decisions with uh, where we can't satisfy all the competing interests, right? And um, there was a I had a, a chapter in my book that got edited out uh, where it was, um, it was called Ethics for Dummies. And one of the most famous case studies at Harvard Business School in the 80s was called The Parable of the Sadhu, uh, S-A-D-H-U, which um, I may not be exactly right here, but I think I'm close enough, is like a Sherpa in the Himalayas, right? And the case was as follows. A, um, a group of New Yorkers, including a, a banker from Morgan Stanley, who ended up coming back and writing this case, was uh, doing uh, climbing um, Everest. And they came across a, a Sherpa dying from, like just lying there, dying from exposure. All his people were gone, he didn't have enough clothes, the dude man was gonna die. So, um, there emerged a split in the group. Some of them said, we should probably make sure this guy doesn't die here. And, the other half, which included this banker, said, we don't know him. Maybe he, this is all his fault. We are on the verge of an accomplishment that we have been working towards for many months. If we stop now, because you know the dynamics of, you know, when can you make it to the whatever, right? Like it, it, it could have, or would have um, uh, rendered their ascent uh, uh, that they wouldn't have succeeded. And um, they gave him some, something to cover him and left him there and, and kept moving. And uh, I said in the book, I was like, the fact that this is considered a debate whether or not to help a dying man is about as apt a metaphor for the ascent of Mount Career as one could think of. And I was like, this is despicable that of all the things that you could teach, you know, you could, you could see yourself teaching a thing about where do we put the new factory? Do we demand a tax cut from this city or do we do it here, which has, you know, more unemployed and do we do this? And um, so you can see where you can be in a situation where you have some sort of murky ethics where it's like, what's the right thing to do here? And I was like, Jesus Christ, what's the right thing to do here? You're gonna debate this? And um, so yeah, I was stunned. I was, uh, m every person I spoke to went to HBS said ethics was uh, an afterthought. Also, um, there's a great anecdote. Jeff Skilling, who went on to run Enron, uh, 
they had a they had a class discussion one day where they said, "Okay, so your product has been discovered to be killing people. Do you keep selling it, or do you stop and try to fix it?" And Jeff Skilling said, and I know this because someone who was a classmate actually wrote an editorial about it, said, you keep making it, it's the government's job to stop that. So um, this is not just someone outside, uh, you know, I went to Wharton, one review of the book was like, ah, you're just jealous, you didn't go to Harvard Business School. I was like, you overestimate me. I do, would not write a 600 page book out of envy. And so, but my point being is, I'm not exaggerating. Like, these are real conversations that happen in that school as recently as 20 years ago. What's the right decision? Do you keep making the lethal product or do you um, and let the regulator stop you or not? So it's, uh, they haven't, um, you know, part of the defense of that is you can't really teach ethics to a, a 25 year old. Right, it's and they say it's, uh, it's a job of your parents or your church or something. But it's like, well, Christ, you can try because if this is what these people um, are thinking, then we have a problem. And again, shareholder capitalism. So I, I think it's, uh, you know, I also sympathize. I wouldn't want to be the ethics professor in a business school, right? It's like working in uh, the back office of a Wall Street firm. If you're not bringing in money, nobody gives a shit what you do. So, um, it's a tough thing to do. Uh, like, one of the roles I didn't take on for myself was, here's how I, I would redesign the business school, uh, you know, according to Duff's rules. Uh, but one of the things that would, that would probably be helpful is, you know, the, to bring up a, a greater core of, of liberal arts teaching into the curriculum of which ethics is a fundamental component. So, um, yeah, I hope that answered the question. Why have time for one more question? It's a great question, you know, because it's like, um, I, my answer to that has always been, um, to try to step back and widen the frame, which is, yes, of course your job as a manager, or if you are running a business. There's an imperative to remain profitable, obviously, or else you will not stick around for much longer unless you, uh, you know, can engage in some kind of financial engineering. Uh, so, of course, um, the point of a business is to make profits. But I always thought, okay, why don't we step back? It's like, you're a human being, right? So, um, what is the point of being a person? And to me, that always sort of did a better job of answering the question. I, we were talking at lunch about how Jensen and his crowd argued that you cannot give a manager uh, more than one objective because they can't manage to two competing objectives. Widen the frame. Ask a parent who has more than one child, right? What is it? Is it possible to serve two ma masters? Yes, it is. It's more difficult, but you know, it's it's 
at the end of the day, I think you are a human first and a employee or a businessman second. And I think the great mistake that we made in America, if not the world, has been to reverse the order of importance of those two. Um, one of my, in, in the book about McKinsey, I make a similar point, which is um, these guys are the high priests of efficiency, right? And rationality. You want to be more efficient? Bring McKinsey in. They'll show you how to do it. They'll fix your processes for you. Uh, they'll uh, help you be a scapegoat if you need to lay people off, right? They're the kings of efficiency. And I made the point, I was like, listen, who's going to, no, like, I'm not going to argue for inefficiency, right? Who wants that? But, um, where do we want to put it in our hierarchy of values? Is efficiency the most important thing to us? I hope not. And uh, there's beauty, there's, you know, uh, there's fairness, there's love, there's all these other things. It's like, yeah, of course we want to be efficient. And same thing, it's like, yeah, we do want to earn a living, but it's a poor, uh, a trade-off to make if you're like, yeah, and in the process I've decided that I'm going to throw out the window all the things that I know about what it is to be a good human, because this is what Michael Jensen told me. So, it, yeah, like it's, it's all a context thing. Actually, sorry, I'll finish with a, uh, one point. When I, for, when I wrote The Firm, um, uh, one of the more surprising endorsements I got was Ralph Nader puts out a, a list of his favorite books of the year. And they're essentially like books that stick it to the man. And he put the firm on it. And uh, when I was starting to work on The Golden Passport, I was like, I think I gotta call Ralph Nader, right? Because why not? He knows who I am. Let me see what he has to say. And it, it was like far more valuable than I had expected. He actually um, is a Harvard Law School graduate and what, wrote the introduction for a book called The High Citadel about Harvard Law School uh, that kind of set, follows a similar approach, which is what was the foundational premise of this place and where are we now? And, you know, it's the same story, right? The, the lawyers have gone from being whatever to being, you know, capitalism's, you know, hatchet men. And he, he gave me a piece of advice, which was the most important piece of advice anybody's ever given me about writing a book. He's like, do not get sucked into having the discussion in, on their terms, right? What you have to do is stay out here and remember what the perspective is. Right? You're not talking about, um, you, you don't want to be talking within the, um, the confines of an actual uh, business education, right? Because you're right, it's like, you, who's going to advocate for um, taking your eye off the profit ball? It's like, you got to stand outside it and say, what is the point of an education? What are we doing here? But from this perspective, and I was, I didn't quite understand what he meant at the time, but as soon as I got into the book, I was like, oh my God, thank you. Because it allowed me to, to look at questions like that and say, yeah, okay, sure. Yes, profits are essential. So is being a good person. Uh, and, you know, if you want to make a choice between those two, go ahead. Like, to me, there's one answer. And it's like the parable of the sad dude. Okay, what do you want to do, climb Mount Everest or let a man die? And um, so, yeah, I think the answer to the question is just to expand the frame.